Good morning. It's Sunday, March 6. We are beginning a new series of messages that will take us through the next uh, couple of months or so, right up until uh, Easter Sunday. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the hymn Amazing Grace, one of the most recognized, familiar, and well-loved songs of the, of the Christian faith. It's, uh, it's got an incredible story behind it, and I'll share a little bit about that with you this morning, and uh, also little bits here and there as we make our way through this series. I'm calling this series Amazing Grace. And it's a, a, a great title for a series because uh, this is the time of year when we are especially remembering the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. It's the season of Lent. For those of you who are familiar with that technical term of the church's calendar, a season that helps us prepare for Easter by remembering the suffering and the dying and everything that Jesus experienced for us. It's really all about grace. It's really the central message of the Bible, grace. The amazing grace of God, which is the gift of God, the gifts of God's love and acceptance and forgiveness. And we're going to see that this morning and in the next number of weeks as we look at some key words and phrases in that familiar hymn that really highlight specific aspects of God's grace and how sweet God's grace is. We're thinking about that this morning, the sweet sound of God's grace. I'm very excited about this series. I hope you will be too. And I encourage you to share these messages with others for whom you think it may be helpful. I think grace is something that we all need. We all recognize our failures, our inadequacy. And when we think about how good God is, we might wonder about how a good and holy God could possibly love people like us. Well, that's what grace is all about. God loves and accepts us as we are. We don't have to earn any points with God. He just lavishes his grace and mercy on us because that's who God is. And we'll see that again this morning as we reflect on this incredible hymn, Amazing Grace. You probably know something about the story behind that hymn. The words were written by John Newton. He was born in 1725 and lived a difficult life in his early years. His mother died when he was only seven. His father remarried, and uh, Newton, at the age of 11, joined his father in life on the sea. His father was uh, very active uh, on board ships and as captains of ships. And when uh, John Newton was only 11, he joined his dad with, uh, with life on the sea, a very dangerous life, very challenging life in many ways. And he eventually became the captain, captain of his own ship. And you probably know the story how John Newton was participating in the slave trade in the 18th century. That horrific and uh, incredibly painful experience for millions of Africans who were taken from their homeland and brought uh, as slaves to, uh, to, the, to the American colonies and to the West Indies. John Newton was very much involved in the slave trade and he knew in his heart that there was something deeply wrong about that. He struggled with it. He remembered even little bits and pieces of his Christian upbringing that his mom gave him, even though, as I said, she died when he was only seven. He remembered his mom's prayers, his mother's devotional reading of, of the Bible, and trying to teach young John about who God is. Well, John wandered from that life. He by his own admission, as he looked back on his life later, saw that his life was one of rebellion, one of hostility to God. In fact, his one description of his life in these years was as follows. My delight and habitual practice was wickedness. I was a slave to wickedness. Interesting that he would use that word because he was so engaged in the slave trade. He knew what it was like for people to be enslaved. And he saw himself later, after his conversion, as one who was a slave to wickedness and rebellion. Even so, in all of these years before his conversion, John Newton experienced the sense that God was pursuing him, that there was more to life than the life he was living, that God was, was somehow mysteriously hunting for him. He read the Bible, he struggled to find God in all of his darkness and rebellion. And the pivotal turning point in John Newton's life took place on March 21, 1748. It's when he experienced a powerful storm at sea. 
He was convinced that he was going to die in that storm, as a number of people on board the ship that he was on did. In fact, there was somebody who was on board right beside him, and, and a big wave came and washed him away. John Newton felt that wave was meant for him, but somehow he was spared. He worked for hours and hours through the night trying to pump water out of that ship to, to fix holes in the side of the ship that the wind and waves had created. At one point in desperation, he remarked to somebody on board the ship with him, if this will not do, the Lord have mercy upon us. Mercy, as he said that word, it was, as somebody has commented, as if that word leaped out of him, as if some other voice had spoken it. He survived the storm by the grace of God, the amazing grace that he would later reflect on and preach as a minister. He studied for the ministry and turned his life around. He felt that God had miraculously saved him. And so he became a pastor, serving small churches in England for many decades. He wrote many hymns. And on New Year's Day, 1773, he led a worship service in his tiny congregation. And this was the first time that he shared the words of the hymn that we now know as Amazing Grace. The original title of that hymn was Faith's Review and Expectation. Seeing how faith has a, a backward look, looking back at all of the goodness that God has given you, and then expectation, looking forward with a future perspective to what God has yet in store for us. We know this hymn as Amazing Grace, and the message that John Newton preached that day was based on an Old Testament passage, 1 Chronicles 17, verses 16 through 17. I'm going to read those verses with you, and just to set that passage up a little bit, David is king near the end of his life, and he has a desire to do something incredible for God. He wants to build God a temple. He knows that up till that point, God had been living in tents and tabernacles that moved around as the people moved, but he wanted to build God an enormous, elaborate house, a temple. He thought the incredible, glorious God was deserving of such a house. But then Nathan the prophet comes to David and gives David a message from the Lord, and that message is simply this. You're not going to build me a house. You can't. But what I'm going to do is build your house, David. And by house, God doesn't mean a literal house. He means it figuratively in terms of the monarchy in Israel, the dynasty that David would become a part of. That house, that royalty, that royal lineage, that monarchy is what God, through the prophet Nathan, tells David he is going to build. And David is just amazed at this. How is it that God could build my house, he wonders, essentially. I want to build him a house, but God wants to build my house. Who am I that God would do this for me? And so this is what uh, leads us to, to these verses in 1 Chronicles 17 that were the focus of John Newton's sermon, New Year's Day, 17, what was it, 1773, and I'm going to read those words beginning at verse uh, 16 and reading through verse 22, just to give us a little bit of a fuller context of how David was amazed at what God had intended for him. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, Lord God, and what is my family that you have brought me thus far? And as if there were, this were not enough in your sight, my God, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant. You, Lord God, have looked on me as though I were the most exalted of men. What more can David say to you for honoring your servant? For you know your servant, Lord. For, in the, sake, for the sake of your servant and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made known all these great promises. There is no one like you, Lord, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whose God went out to redeem a people for himself, and to make a name for yourself, and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations from before your people, whom you redeemed from Egypt? You made your people Israel your very own forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Who am I 
a question that David naturally wondered as he considered God's plans for him, very different from the plans he had for the Lord. And this is what makes grace so amazing. You know, so many times we think we must do things for God. We have to live right. We've got to believe the right things. It's about what we do for God that uh, our acceptance is based on. But that's not at all what the Bible teaches. It's not what we do for God, but what God does for us that makes a relationship with God so amazing. This is what grace is all about. God does things for us knowing who we are, accepting who we are. Maybe you're familiar with the words of the song, Who Am I? A familiar song that uh, Casting Crowns set uh, to music some years ago now. It's, uh, it's a wonderful song. It really expresses the kind of thing that we're reflecting on today. Who am I? The song wonders as David wondered. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name? Would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. John Newton would have approved and loved that song because it connects very much with the words from 1 Chronicles 17 where David wonders, who am I? John Newton himself was astounded at the grace of God at work in his life. Who am I, he must have wondered, that you, God, would, would work such an incredible, powerful work of, of healing in my life, this slave trader, one whose delight was in wickedness. Who am I that you should love me? This is really why grace is so amazing, because we rest in the gift of God. It doesn't matter what we've done or who we are. It's all about who God is and the gift that he wants to give us. Sometimes I think we acknowledge the grace of God in a theoretical, abstract sense. We understand it. We might have heard many sermons preached on it. We've sung about it, perhaps. But we wonder sometimes if it's really true for me. Is it possible that God could love someone like me in spite of what I've done? This is what David asked in this uh, scripture reading. Lord, you know me. And David certainly had a history, as we know from reading the Bible, all of the things that he did with Bathsheba, with Uriah, and, and other instances that, that show how wicked he was. We all, all have examples of that in our own lives. We can focus so much on our inadequacy and sin that we wonder sometimes, how is it possible that God's grace can be real for me? We wonder about that, and yet we also crave it. We want to know that God loves and accepts us. I remember reading in Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace, probably 25 years ago now. He retells the story of uh, something that uh, is found in one of Ernest Hemingway's short stories. It really captures how God desires to show people his love and acceptance, how we crave that, and yet also run from it. Hemingway's short story is called Capital of the World, and in that story we read about a Spanish father who decides to, to find his son who had run away to Madrid. Kind of like a prodigal son story, only except uh, in the case of the prodigal son in the Bible where the father stays home, the father in Hemingway's story goes out to Madrid to find his lost son. He doesn't know where he is or how to find him, and so the father takes out an ad in the local newspaper, and it simply reads as follows. Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana, noon Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. Well, Paco is a common name in Spain. And when Father goes to Hotel Montana at the appointed time and day, he finds 800 young men named Paco, all hoping to see their Papa. Isn't that an incredible illustration of our hunger for God's grace, our desire for acceptance, and also the Father who freely gives it? This is a picture of who God is, searching, waiting, giving, wanting to 
enable us to hear with our own ears the sweet sound of amazing grace, a sound that is greater and more beautiful than anything we have ever heard, a sound of acceptance, the melody of God's grace. This is really what John Newton experienced in a profound way, and, and we don't have to have that kind of dramatic conversion-like experience in order to appreciate and receive the amazing grace of God. Many of us have probably grown up knowing the Lord. Our parents, our grandparents, friends and teachers, youth leaders, pastors have all had an influence on our life from a young age. We know about the grace of God, but have we experienced it? Have we accepted it? Have we surrendered to the God, to the Father, who is relentless in his search for us so that we can hear the amazing melody of his grace. I think again of this season of Lent and how when Jesus was on the cross in his dying moments, if you know the story, you know that he was crucified with two other men, two thieves, one on his right and one on his left. And one of them had undoubtedly, both of them in fact, had led a, a very disobedient, violent life, but the one turned to the Lord and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In desperation, perhaps in his dying breath, he cried out to Jesus asking for mercy. And you know, perhaps what Jesus said to that man, today you will be with me in paradise. That's grace, it's acceptance. Even it comes at, if it comes at the very end of a person's life, there it is. It's not about who that person is or who we are, but who Jesus is. It's what makes this season of Lent really significant because here we focus on what the Lord has done for us. You know, sometimes people approach the season of Lent as a time where we have to give things up. We have to do things that will, that will in some way make us more deserving of God's love or more focused on it, if nothing else, and try to understand more fully how our sacrifices in some way contribute to the relationship we have with God, that's not what it's about at all. Lent is not about our self-giving, it's about his self-giving. It's not what we give up, it's what Jesus gave up. That's amazing grace. He does this for us. He loves us. He accepts us. One of Newton's last sermons that he ever preached is where he uh, speaks these familiar words. My memory is nearly gone, but I do remember two things, that I am a great sinner, and that Christ is a great savior. Jesus Christ, the descendant of David, is the ultimate fulfillment of the promise that God made to David about the monarchy, the dynasty, the king, the house. It's all based on Jesus, our king. What he has done in his self-giving, in his surrender, the gift of his life is the source of our life. And I hope you know that. I hope you have heard the sweet sound of God's grace. I hope you know that you're accepted and loved as you are. If you know that, then you know life has real meaning and it's just the beginning of a relationship with God, which as the hymn Amazing Grace goes on to describe is, is one that will continue in, in the radiance and fullness of God's glory. We will still be singing praise to God for thousands and thousands of endless years in the fullness of his kingdom. We'll explore that too as this series progresses. But I hope you can know already now that the amazing grace of God is yours. We need only to accept it. We need only to hear the sweet sound to be drawn into it. It's what John's, John Newton's life was all about. Countless others who have experienced the Lord's grace, I hope you have too. And I hope you live in the joy and the sweetness of that grace every day. Thanks so much for watching. I look forward to sharing more messages with you about God's amazing grace. Be well.